So then why Stargirl? We're made from the dust of dead stars. You know how everybody was revisiting 500 Days of Summer and realizing that Summer wasn't a villain nor was she a manic pixie dream girl? It's like that, but with Stargirl. It's the first summer of the second millennia, and already established author and Newbery Award winner, Jerry Spinelli releases his 22nd novel, Stargirl. With its minimalist cover of pictures instead of text for a title and message of nonconformity, as seen with the titular character, it turns heads and soon becomes a New York Times bestseller as well as a Parents' Choice Award gold winner. It floods shelves of scholastic book fairs and soon, Stargirl societies spring up in middle and high schools across the United States. Stargirl's effect on preteen and teenage girls reached its peak in 2006, as seen with the metrics from the Stargirl Society page on Jerry Spinelli's website. The first Stargirl Society post, according to the Wayback Machine, came out in 2006, where the mission statement was posted as well as activities girls could do together during their meetings. How to start a Stargirl Society Stargirl Societies are underway in both middle and high schools. Inspired by the novel and its main character, the Societies offer girls a chance to become Stargirls in their own right. The first objective is to promote individuality and self-confidence as an alternative to brand name conformity. Suggested activities are to read the book, plan and carry out school or community projects, you don't have committees, you have constellations, stage an inner beauty pageant, ukulele recital, make stuff, and visit a planetarium or observatory. The first Stargirl Society formed in 2004 out of Kent, Ohio, where educator Kathy Fraser gave the idea to some of her students. In a 2007 interview about the first Stargirl Society, Fraser said, these were highly creative, individualistic students, and they loved the novel and the message it gave. They told me they wished they had read it in sixth grade, since in middle school there is such peer pressure to conform, and it's so easy to lose one's own self. Stargirl was able to keep her own creative spirit and individualism intact. Spinelli and his wife Eileen, who has been said to have inspired the character of Stargirl and who the book is dedicated to, drove seven hours from their Pennsylvania home to spend a full day with some 50 girls. I was struck and then settled by Jerry's down-to-earthness common Sarah Jackson, a senior who was the youngest of the society's founders. He was as eager to listen to us as we were to listen to him. Fraser adds, The girls really enjoyed the opportunity to talk about relationships, being yourself, and believing in yourself. A key component of the Kent Stargirl Society is its community service initiative, meant to imitate the character's penchant for reaching out to others. The members made cards of appreciation for the school's often overlooked cafeteria workers and janitors, as well as decorations for their workspaces. Needless to say, Stargirl was pretty big 15 years ago, and I remember seeing this book at book fairs everywhere as a preteen, and just never getting into it. I liked reading as a kid, but I mainly preferred reading the Click series or the Private series, much to my mom's dismay who wanted me reading Anne of Green Gables, and Stargirl just went over my head at the time. Another reason why I didn't think I really liked reading Stargirl as a kid or could never really get into the book was because it was told from a male character's point of view and I was really into reading female-centric stories and Stargirl herself in the story is only seen through the perspective of the male character or the male protagonist, Leo. I remember trying to read it as a kid and finding it kind of odd how Stargirl wasn't the main character and in fact the main character was this boy. I think I found it kind of boring, like please give me my mean white girl mystery thrillers instead. And though I think it's cool how the Stargirl societies encourage young girls to do community service and have a deeper discussion about the literature that they consumed, I also think it's kind of weird how a group that was about non-conformity also encourages conformity, but this is a good type of conformity because we go to planetariums and aren't like other girls. Though of course, I think in the end, it was a healthy outlet for girls who didn't like quote unquote girlier things like makeup or shopping or whatever because like I said many times before, girls are individual human beings with different interests and we should encourage all types of girlhoods and not praise one type over the other. But this society, at least to me, did seem kind of like turning their nose up at other girls or at least the way that it was framed on the website.
So let's get into what Stargirl, the original book, is about. Stargirl, the book, is told from Leo's perspective. Leo is a high school boy who conforms to high school norms. He has a small friend group, but his best friend is Kevin, and they host a TV show together called Hot Seat, which is called an Inquisition in the book, and the interviewee is called a victim. It was very ahead of its time. And that's basically the only thing going on at MICA Area High School, or MAHS, that is, until Stargirl comes to town. Stargirl has been homeschooled for most, if not all, of her life, but has come to the local high school because she wants to make friends. This is how Leo describes the first moment he sees her. And then I saw her, at lunch. She wore an off-white dress so long it covered her shoes. It had ruffles around the neck and cuffs that looked like it could have been her great-grandmother's wedding gown. Her hair was the color of sand. It fell to her shoulders. Something was strapped across her back. But it wasn't a book bag. At first I thought it was a miniature guitar. I found out later it was a ukulele. When she came by our table, I got my first good look at her face. She wasn't gorgeous, wasn't ugly. A sprinkle of freckles crossed the bridge of her nose. Mostly, she looked like a hundred other girls in school, except for two things. She wore no makeup, and her eyes were the biggest I had ever seen, like deer eyes caught in headlights. She twirled and she went past. Her flaring skirt brushed my pant leg, and then she marched out of the lunchroom. So, as you can see, Stargirl is visibly different, but she also acts differently. She sings to her classmates on their birthdays, she plays the ukulele, she has a pet rat, and she says the Pledge of Allegiance wrong on purpose. As Spinelli writes, she laughed when there was no joke, she danced when there was no music, she had no friends, yet she was the friendliest person in school. In response to Stargirl's oddness, her peers bully her, and I honestly really do like that because, yeah, high school is just like that sometimes. The kids get pissed off at Stargirl just because she's unapologetically herself, and there are things that she does wrong that are truly insensitive, which we'll get to later, but for the most part, people just don't like being confronted with things or people that are different than they are because it inadvertently makes them question all of their own life choices. For example, when some people meet someone who says they don't eat meat or they don't drink alcohol, they automatically take it as a front to their own lifestyle when the other person is simply stating a fact about themselves. And that's basically what Stargirl does to the kids of Micah High. But rather than not drinking or not eating meat, Stargirl is just nice to people and thinks of others before herself and just doesn't care about what she wears. But by doing so, inadvertently makes everyone else feel worse about themselves and they respond to her with cruelty. However, this all changes when she becomes the high school's good luck charm. One day, Stargirl goes to a football game, performs to the crowd, and her positive energy leads the school to victory, which is a big deal considering that at MICA, no one really cared about anything before Stargirl showed up. They were just a boring school where everyone was too cool to care, but Stargirl shakes things up and they start to feel motivated about winning sports and start acting more carefree. In fact, Stargirl's energy becomes infectious. As Leo says in the book, girls liked her, boys liked her, and most remarkable, the intention came from all kinds of kids. Shy mice and princesses, jocks and eggheads, we honored her by imitation. A chorus of ukulele strummed in the lunchroom. Flowers appeared on classroom desks. One day it rained and a dozen girls ran outside to dance. The pet shop at Micah Mall ran out of rats. She gave us something to talk about. She was entertaining. This line here gives me a slight hint that Spinelli was self-aware of the type of relationship that Leo and Stargirl were playing into. The school sees Stargirl as a form of entertainment, not as a real human being or girl. The problem is that we don't see how that damages her psyche because she's too perfect. We'll get into that later, but for now, everything seems to be going well for the football team and later the basketball team, even though Stargirl insists on cheering for both sides and not just Micah High. She cheered whenever the ball went in the basket, regardless of which team shot it. It was the strangest sight. The other team scores, the MAHS crowd sits glumly on their hands, while Stargirl, alone, pops up cheering. Though this annoys her classmates, they let her do it because Micah is on a winning streak. However, other things she does do start to get on her classmates' nerves. 
For example, after the death of her fellow student's grandfather, Stargirl shows up to the funeral crying and even goes inside the family's house to mourn with them. Afterward, the mourners were invited to Anna's house for lunch. About 30 came. There was a buffet of cold cuts and salads and cookies. Stargirl was there, chatting with members of the family, but not eating or drinking anything. Suddenly, Anna heard her mother's voice. It was no louder than the others, but it was different. What are you doing here? Sudden stillness. Everyone is staring. They were in the front picture window. Anna had never seen her mother so angry. Mrs. Grisdale had been very close to her father. They had built an addition to their house so he could live with them. She glared down at Stargirl. Answer me. Stargirl gave no reply. You didn't even know him, did you? Still, Stargirl said nothing. Did you? And then Anna's mother was flinging open the door as if banishing her to the desert. Leave my house. In another insensitive instance, Stargirl buys back a bike from a thrift shop and gives it back to the family who put it there in the first place. Not realizing that the kid who rode the bike got into an accident on said bike, and by not telling the family who bought it, it became the topic of a family squabble, and they later threw the bike away. Mr. Pike was mad because nobody he asked would admit to buying the bike, and probably because he hadn't done it himself. Mrs. Pike was mad because no way, not for at least one year, would she allow Danny back on wheels. One night, the new, still unridden bike wound up at the Pike's front curb with the trash cans. All of these instances of Stargirl going too far start to pile up until she ends up on the hot seat or the mock inquisition as it's called. Leo doesn't want to put her on, but he never really vocalizes this until it's too late, showing his not-a-great-guy side. Not to mention that though Leo is fascinated by Stargirl, he never reaches out to her or has the gall to protect her from harassment. He lets people be mean to her despite his seemingly deep affection for her. Though at this point in the book, his affection isn't known to anyone and they're not dating, he just admires her from afar. Anyway, the mob, as Finelli writes, starts asking their questions and things get bad fast. Stargirl's intentions are questioned. Why does she do the things she does? Her classmates ask, What's the matter with you? Why can't you be normal? Why do you need to be so different? And of course, why don't you wear makeup? He's really hung up on the makeup thing, by the way. Anyway, that's the end of Stargirl's popularity, though she doesn't get kicked off the cheer team until someone throws a tomato at her. And then finally, towards the middle of the book, Leo and Stargirl finally get together. Stargirl questions why Leo followed her that day into the desert and even jokingly accuses him of stalking her. Sneaking after me, she poked at me again, hard this time, but her eyes were twinkling, stalking me. But of course, she's not mad that Leo did this, and even though she does have her sad and more self-reflective moments like on the hot seat, in the book she never apologizes to the family she's hurt and is never unhappy or sad about her peers rejecting her. Something that annoys me, and I think a lot of other readers, is just how unrealistically self-aware she is in all aspects of her life, at least most of the time. She almost has no emotions besides happiness. She's not insecure with Leo at all, and of course is totally aware of the power she holds over him, knowing full well that he's obsessed with her. She says, You're smitten with me. You were speechless to behold my beauty. You had never met anyone so fascinating. You thought of me every waking minute. You dreamt about me. You couldn't stand it. You couldn't let such wonderfulness out of your sight. You had to follow me. She batted her eyelids and gave me a flirty grin. Don't you like different? Sure I do, I said maybe a little too quickly. I know what your problem is. Really? I said. What? You're jealous. You're upset because I'm paying all this attention to other people and not enough to you. As their relationship progresses, Stargirl, being a bit of a manic pixie dream girl, shows Leo how to meditate, people watch, and appreciate life more by just enjoying the simpler things like screaming into the void. Don't you want the universe to hear you? But Leo starts to realize that the school is shunning him for dating Stargirl, and he soon starts to lose his mind over this. He thinks to himself, I had never realized how much I needed the attention of others to confirm my own presence. He even becomes known around school as Mr. Stargirl. I understood why this was happening to me. In the eyes of the student body, she was part of my identity. I was her boyfriend. I was Mr. Stargirl. He starts to resent Stargirl more and more until he even just starts to avoid her at school altogether. In one instance, Stargirl displays a public confession of her love for Leo and his reaction is something. <laughs> Painted on the sheet in broad red brushstrokes with a valentine heart enclosing the words, Stargirl loves Leo. My first impulse was to drag the Spanish teacher to the window and say, look, she loves me. 
My second impulse was to run outside and rip the sign away. I think it's interesting that Leo gets to be like this normal, insecure teenager who gets embarrassed and who also wants to fit in, and he has real flaws. He's definitely not a heroic character, even though we'll see by the end of the book he's still kind of framed as one, but it's annoying that the same isn't applied to Stargirl in the book. Stargirl in the book is just there to make Leo appreciate life and the universe more and whatever. She doesn't get to be complex because she seems to not really have any flaws or emotions besides being good all the time and wanting to help people all the time. Anyway, things get even worse for Leo and he continues to resent Stargirl even though he's perfectly fine with dating her in private. Fed up, he then exhaustingly explains to Stargirl why she can't just not care about what people think, not just about the way she dresses, but that people have boundaries and that she needs to respect them. For example, not barging into other people's funerals, or singing to people who don't want to be sung to. And again, by the end of the book, she never apologizes to the family whose funeral she crashed, nor to the family about rebuying the bike that they intentionally left at the thrift store. Anyway, after this whole debate with Leo, she comes to school as Susan, which is her given name, and is of course wearing makeup and designer clothes. <laughs> she bought shirts and pants and shorts and costume jewelry and makeup. I began to notice that the items of clothing had one thing in common. They all had the designer's name plastered prominently on them. She seemed to buy not for color or for style, but for designer label size. And then Leo seems to be happy again. I didn't walk, I strutted. I was Susan Carraway's boyfriend. I, me, really, that's Susan Carraway? The one with the tiny barrettes and toe rings? Yep, that's the one, my girlfriend. Call me Mr. Susan. Stargo plans to go to the speech contest, win number one, and then have the entire school love her again. And though it seems as though she's really interested in being normal and popular, she's really not and most of it just seems like a joke to her. Anyway, after they win the speech contest, the speech of which we never see, they come back to school and everyone's still shunning them. Afterwards, Stargirl decides to go back to being her old self and Leo thinks to himself how in that moment he hates her. Walking with her after school that day, I said, I guess you're giving up, huh? She looked at me. Giving up on what? On being popular? On being... She smiled. Normal? I shrugged. Yes, she said firmly. Later on, she says confidently, I know you're not going to ask me to the Aquatillo Ball. It's okay. She gave me her smile of infinite kindness and understanding. The smile I had seen her aim at so many other needy souls, and in that moment, I hated her. She goes to the dance, he doesn't, and then by being her authentic self, the whole school suddenly loves her again, and they all dance, and she disappears, and that's it, really. She even gets slapped and is okay with it and responds by kissing the girl that slapped her on the cheek. Leo didn't go to the dance, so this is all from eyewitness accounts, as he says in the book. And yeah, this all really apparently happened. 15 years go by and Leo still thinks that he's being watched by Stargirl and still thinks that he has a freaking chance with her. I wonder what she calls herself now. I wonder if she's lost her freckles. I wonder if I'll ever get another chance. I wonder, but I don't despair. Though I have no family of my own, I don't feel alone. I know that I'm being watched. When I read that, I was like, what the actual fuck? Leo does get some self-awareness at the end by saying, I knew he was tempted to say more, probably to tell me how cowardly that I blew the best chance that I would ever have, but his smile returned and his eyes were tender again. And nothing harsher than the cherry smoke came out of his mouth. The man he's referring to is Archie, who is like this older guidance counselor type figure who never reprimands Leo for his cowardice. Which, okay, to be fair, he's an insecure kid and that's realistic and normal, but like, I feel like there's a lesson to be learned here. The biggest question I have about this book is, who is this or was this for? It seems to be aimed at young girls, which I think is fine, but shouldn't it also be kind of aimed toward men who need to take a look in the mirror? Stargirl and Leo are flawed characters, which makes them relatable and interesting, but Stargirl in the book is such a mess. <laughs> Though there are moments of reflection about intention versus impact, she again never apologizes, unrealistically doesn't care about what people think about her, and is of course what I like to call an exceptional girl character. A girl that's not like other girls, but also is every other girl who also happens to fit perfectly into the male gaze and the male fantasy of how girls should be. She frustrates me, but I think even with the book being as flawed as it is, she still fascinates me, and the book itself just fascinates me, and deserves, I think, more than a passing glance of you know, manic pixie dream girl for kids. And this, of course, leads me to the honest, much more self-aware movie adaptation directed by Julia Hart, starring Grace Vanderwall. Just... 
So clearly Jerry Spinelli's book is a bit outdated. That's not a dunk on the book. That's just how time works. Though there are some elements that do show some sort of nuance to Stargirl's character, like the whole intentions versus impact and how Stargirl isn't perfect and that Leo is framed as selfish and mean-spirited, for the most part, it sticks to the standard manic pixie dream girl trope of girl comes into male protag's life to help him see the beauty in the world and what he was missing all along, blah, 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 blah. The movie adaptation, which is currently streaming on Disney+, Plus, brings the story into the present day, and it's honestly a great breath of fresh air. In an Entertainment Weekly interview, this is what the director and screenwriter Julia Hart said when asked about Stargirl playing into the Manic Pixie Dream Girl trope. Speaking of how the story is told from Leo's perspective, how did you make sure to avoid Stargirl becoming a Manic Pixie Dream Girl? I like to believe that the movie addresses the trope and then acknowledges to the audience and is breaking it by being like, you think you know what this is by looking at it, but this is a deep, authentic, aching, curious, brilliant young woman who should be allowed to wear and sing and express whatever she wants. She so strongly believes in being her true self, but like a real person, she falters and gives in to the temptation to fit in and be liked, but ultimately at the end of the day can be true to who she is and be her true self. Not to spoil anything, but the fact that she doesn't play into the male character's fantasy of her and cuts her own path means that she's not a manic pixie dream girl. She doesn't become what the man wants her to be and that was really important to us. And after watching the movie a few times, I do think that Hart's intentions really shine through of not having Stargirl play into the manic pixie dream girl trope and it's really good. In the book, Stargirl isn't upset that her peers reject her. She's not written like a real teenager and she's instead written as an exceptional young woman. Not like other girls, who's so overly mature and nurturing that she's incredibly hard to connect to. In the movie, Stargirl gets to be sad and secure and even angry. She gets to speak her mind and yes, does conform to society because of Leo's insistence, but when he doesn't show any appreciation for her efforts, she rejects him and he learns to embrace her for who she is. The plot of the movie follows basically the same plot of the book, but with a few crucial differences. Firstly, Stargirl and Leo start dating right off the bat, but only when Stargirl becomes popular after she becomes a cheerleader. This adds some great tension to the movie. You see, one of Leo's goals in the movie, as well as in the book, is that he craves attention and validation from his peers, and he gets that with Stargirl. This dives deeper into themes that were present in the book, the main one being how Stargirl is used by the people around her for their own gain. And the Stargirl in the movie, unlike in the book, does realize that she's being used and realizes that Leo's main motivation of being with her is to just get attention and to be popular. He says to her in one scene, Being with you is like the most anyone has ever looked at me in my entire life. And Stargirl responds to him with silence. Stargirl grows ever more popular and is used as a good luck charm for the school. She becomes a cheerleader like in the book. And in one overextended sequence, we can see how used she's become. As the camera pans around the football field in almost a parodic extended high school musical sequence, Stargirl disappears. We struggle to find her, to see her. The audience is put into the mindset of the school, who only sees her as this object to be used, so much so that she becomes a prop in her own number. Stargirl's popularity starts to go downhill after she helps a player from the other team, which is also present in the book, and the school turns on her and so does Leo, at least for a bit. He is angry with her, but he eventually gives in because he does really love her, but like in the book, only when it's convenient for him and his social status. Stargirl goes on the hot seat to try to make amends, and the bike incident is revealed. Except in this version, the boy who got into the bike accident can never ride a bike again, and the sister, Hillary, calls Stargirl out. She asks her, what gives you the right? What makes you think you know what's best for everyone? As a side note, in the book, Hillary is a mean girl. She even threatens to drop Stargirl's pet rat, and she's the one who slaps her in the face at the dance. In this version, Hillary is still popular, but is given another character's motivation to dislike Stargirl, which is the bike incident. Anyway, she calls Stargirl out for not thinking about the repercussions of her actions, and rather than the school bullying Stargirl just because she's different, they bully her because sometimes her impact on others is negative rather than positive, even if her intentions are in the right place. As Julia Hart said in a Yahoo News interview, a really important idea for young people these days is intent versus impact especially for young white people and young men to understand the impact of their actions on different groups of people who maybe don't look like them, Hart said. Something that was really important for me to explore with the character of Hillary is this idea that if you don't know someone's full story, the intention of your actions might not matter in comparison to a negative impact. 
Stargirl abruptly leaves the hot seat, and the next time we see her, she's revealed as Susan and normal. She doesn't stick out and even gets a cell phone. Leo is of course happy because now they can still be together without drawing attention to themselves, and they head to the speech contest. In the movie, it's actually selfishly Leo's idea that them winning number one at the contest might mean that Stargirl could go back to being cool again, and not Stargirl's idea. I mean, maybe it was silly, but I... Th I guess I thought maybe some of them would be happy you won. Which is a great addition. In the book, actually, Leo doesn't think that this plan will work, that Stargirl winning number one at the speech contest will really do anything, but he goes with it anyway because he wants to make her happy, and she really thinks that it's going to change people's minds, but it doesn't. So I like how in the movie they actually change that. I think in order to fully subvert the manic pixie dream girl trope, you need to paint the guy character as kind of a bad dude, or at least teach him a lesson, which I think both Spinelli and Hart couldn't fully do, which we'll get to later, but Hart does try a lot more, and it shows. So we get to the speech contest, and finally hear Stargirl's own words, which we don't hear in the book, and this speech just lives rent-free in my head, so I'm just gonna read all of it. I don't know why I do a lot of things lately. I bet you find that too, right? And it's because we don't think. We just do. We don't take a step back and process. Everything's so instant these days. How can we? Dinner in minutes. A thousand photographs in one burst. You have to like something this second. You have to know how you feel about everything. You can't be unsure or confused or change your mind. There's no time to figure out who you are. You have to know right now. Have you ever seen a flower grow? I mean, of course not. It's nearly impossible to wait for anything that takes that long. But if you did, it would change you. It would slow you down. It would remind you that real things take time. And it's magic too, isn't it? I mean, so are 1,000 photographs in one burst. But a flower, you plant a seed in the ground and a whole world develops and stretches out and opens up. It's easy to get confused when we're moving so fast and to think that we're doing the right thing, when we're really not. But if we're lucky, we could find a balance. We could take a step back. We could take a breath. The next time that you see a flower sticking up out of the ground, or in a vase, just remember that part of what makes it beautiful is how long it took to grow. And this speech is why I decided to make this freaking video in the first place. It's so freaking good. Stargirl says these words to the crowd, but I think she's really saying them to herself. The speech is about her need to grow and how she as a teen girl is gonna make mistakes, is gonna screw up, but that's part of being a teenager and maturing and that we need to appreciate people's growth rather than expect people to just know everything right away or expect people to do the right thing the first time. The speech can be applied to so many things, to being a teenager, to trying to make amends with someone that you might have wronged, and to just being a human being. Yes, it starts out very boomery with the whole instant food and too many photos tech is bad thing, but it ends up with such a sweet sentiment that it really kind of changed my outlook on life, like not gonna lie. Stargirl realizes at this moment that she's effed up. She doesn't always know what's best for people, but that she's trying her best and that all she can do is keep on growing. And in the end of the movie, she actually apologizes to Hillary for the bike thing rather than just not saying anything. After this, Stargirl wins first place, but Leo is of course sad because he wanted to be applauded as Mr. Susan or Mr. Stargirl or whatever, but no one at the school cares that they won this contest. And when he voices this to Stargirl, she rightfully gets angry at him and calls him out for not understanding nor listening to her freaking speech. They then go to the dance separately. Stargirl forgives Leo and surprises his narcissistic ass by letting him have his own solo musical number at the end and get all the attention that he's been missing. I'm just kidding, but also not. I think it's funny how this is a surprise for him after Stargirl just seemingly realized that sometimes it's better to get consent from the people you're doing random acts of kindness for. But at the same time, I like to think that she did this on purpose to make Leo uncomfortable as a form of payback. Anyway, after the dance, she just disappears, and that's seemingly the end of it. Or is it? So in 2007, Jerry Spinelli published Love Stargirl, which is the sequel to his best-selling book that I've been talking about for the past 20 minutes. I haven't read it yet, but I am planning to read it eventually after I stop reeling from reading the first one. The movie is also getting a sequel. According to Diz Insider, Elijah Richardson plays Evan, the romantic lead opposite Vanderwall, 
Uma Thurman, a musician by the name of Roxanne Martell, whom Stargirl encounters along her journey and becomes inspired by, and Judy Greer as Anna Stargirl's mother. Jude Hirsch will play Mr. Mitchell, one of Stargirl's new neighbors, while Tyrell Jackson Williams will play Terrell, Evan's older brother and aspiring filmmaker. I'm honestly really excited for the sequel because I'm glad that they're casting people of color to actually be like prominent characters in the movie rather than just like filling the frame with people of color because diversity but not giving them big parts. In the first movie, Karan Brar does play Kevin, which is awesome, but he doesn't really get a story of his own and is basically like the Indian best friend character, I guess. Anna Cheska Brown plays Tess Reed, who is part of Leo's friend group and is also a lesbian, though her sexuality is only in a blink and you miss it scene. All of her feelings, all of her attentions float outward. She had no ego. This is how Leo describes Stargirl. A girl with no ego, no desires of her own, a girl who doesn't care about appearances or looks, just about being happy and making other people happy all the time. And the more I wrote this script, the more turned off by the Stargirl societies and the book version of Stargirl I became. Stargirl may not be a manic pixie dream girl in the movie or in the book, but she sure is the feminine ideal realized in that she's a nurturing motherly figure while also being coquette and aware of her own attractiveness and power over men, but not being a whore who wears makeup, of course. I think Stargirl was a well-intentioned letter by a man aimed at young girls to teach them not to care about what other people think about them. But ironically, you have to be extremely selfless to do so, but also isn't that what women are told to be already? Make sacrifices, make other people happy, don't wear makeup because men don't like it. And it's like, well, how empowering is this message anyway? Of course, throughout the book and in the movie, Stargirl doesn't really care about what men think of her or about boys at all or male approval, and is perfectly happy doing her own thing. But I don't know, the book version in particular was kind of a huge disappointment after watching the movie. One thing that the book does get right, however, is that Stargirl has friends and a life outside of Leo. Like Doris, one of her friends who actually gets named in the book, but in the movie, Stargirl has no other friends outside of Leo. We see one girl that she hangs out with, or a few kids that she hangs out with, but they don't get lines and we don't even know their names and after she starts dating Leo, we don't really see them ever again. What the movie adaptation misses as well, though it's still better than the book, is that Leo is still framed as a good guy in the end. He still sees himself as overly important and special because he sees how special Stargirl is, when no one else did. And it's like, yeah, you only used her to get popular, you ass. Is she... No, it's stupid. Is she magic? Information found just like anyone else. Only nobody else did find it. Because nobody else cared to. Both the book and the movie really seem to miss the mark of framing Leo as the one who needs to change and do the work, not by just being more outwardly confident and enjoying life, but by seeing women as full human beings and not mystical beings or magic. Both Leos fail to do this kind of self-reflection, and both Leos never apologize to Stargirl. In the end, I do really like Stargirl. I'm honestly fascinated by the book and movie and also her character and what she stands for for young girls. In both the book and the movie, she's more than what she appears to be. And in both, there is good commentary that she's being used for convenience by either her peers or even by her own boyfriend. And I think that she deserves to be critically looked at more just like other seemingly manic pixie dream girls like Summer, for instance. At the same time, 
The progression of the male character of Leo falls flat in both instances because he never realizes that he was part of Stargirl's demise, or at least tries to voice a sincere reflection or apology. At the end of both, he still sees himself as a special enough guy or a good enough guy to be good enough for Stargirl, without realizing that he's actually just a mediocre dude. Please let me know what you thought of Stargirl down in the comments below, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thank you so much to my patrons and members. Bye.